opening song that we sing every Sunday morning before we start Sunday school. Now the next song is, um, what is it? Jingle Bell Song. Jingle Bell Song. <laughs> That's the next time, pretty soon. We're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Nice try. <laughs> Testament reading for today comes to us from the prophet Zephaniah, the first chapter. As we uh, continue on in the church year, we approach ever closer to that final Sunday of the church year, 
keeping in mind the second coming of Christ, the day of the Lord, the ultimate day of judgment. And Zephaniah uh, points this out very strongly, uh, pointing towards that uh, those who, who mock God, those who worship other gods, the Lord comes and judges. Uh, that's not our job, that's his job. And we uh, will hear later, as we hear from the Thessalon uh, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, that the reason this day holds no fear for us is because of the gift of grace in Christ. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traitors are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For our epistle reading, we hear from St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church, the fifth chapter. St. Paul also is pointing the Thessalonians towards the, the looking forward to the day of the Lord, but reminding them that even though the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night, we are awake, and the way that we are awake is that we have faith in God and in his son Christ Jesus, so that we know that our sins are forgiven, and the only way we survive this judgment is through him. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as we hear from the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. This is Jesus telling of the parable of the servants and the talents. Jesus said, 
For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But the one who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gathered and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. For the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, o Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to each and every one of you through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Creating something gives you a certain license over it, doesn't it? If you were to paint a painting or mold a clay pot on a potter's wheel or a vase, you have a choice to do with it what you want, right? You can display it, you can sell it, you could destroy it if it's not up to your standards. The act of creation gives the creator the right and ability to do with it as they see fit, right? And scripture is very clear about who created us, who created our universe, the planets, the stars, the earth and its ground, the seas, the animals, the plants, and of course, the humans. Our God did all of that. He even made things that Genesis doesn't even talk about. You're not floating in the air right now because God made gravity. But he doesn't mention it in, in Genesis. God made physics and the laws that govern the things that work in our world. God made chemistry. He made how the atoms fit together with molecular bonds. He made logic. He made intelligence, ingenuity, strength. Wisdom, these concepts that we just simply think are there, God created, God made them. And just as I said, the creator has a choice to do with its creation, it all belongs to him. You know, we talk about the actions that we take or the thoughts that we have. We build our houses, we buy our, our food, or we uh, you know, create something on the side, but... If we think about it, everything can be traced back to God's creation. 
He created our bodies and our minds, and therefore he created the skills that we have and the intelligence that we use. When we accomplish a task, God created the raw materials for us to accomplish those tasks. So in a very real way, you can consider that where everything comes from is God, including ourselves and our abilities. It all belongs to him, and we are just in charge of it for a short amount of time, a temporary moment. Have you ever been in charge of somebody else's possession? Maybe uh, you were house-sitting for somebody, or maybe they were going away on vacation and you had their pet in your house for a while, or, or, or some other thing that they needed you to watch and take care of. You're, typically, people are more careful with the possessions of others than they are with their own. Because when the friend returns or the family member returns, you want that thing that they entrusted to your care to be in at least as good a shape, if not better, than when they lent it to you in the first place. We're careful with things that don't belong to us because, well, they don't belong to us. So we call this concept stewardship. Being a steward means you are in charge of things that really are not yours, but you have possession of them for a temporary amount of time. That word stewardship carries a certain amount of baggage, though, doesn't it? Because when we hear that word stewardship, oftentimes, especially in the context of the church, it's usually about church offerings. And everybody starts grabbing their wallets and being very concerned. But the fact of the matter is that stewardship is more than just how much you put in the offering plate. That's an important piece of it, surely, but stewardship is a whole picture of life. I don't want to discredit church giving, because of course the church needs giving to exist. And we should be mindful of how much we provide to church, but if it's just that, we miss the point. I want you to think of stewardship as a way of looking at your whole life. Not just what you do here in this building, but every aspect of what you do work and live. It's not just money to church. Ultimately, it's how you use the gifts that God has given you. We hear this parable today of, of these three men who were given talents. Now, talents is a monetary uh, amount of money. And, and the talents actually were uh, quite expensive. They were a large amount of money, but uh, the point is that the master owns these talents and lends them to his servants. Now, the first two servants see this as a gift. This is an opportunity. This is how my master cares for me. He provides this, these means to me, and I'm going to use them to the best of my ability. And what do they do? They earn more. Whereas the servant who received only one talent is fearful. Fearful of the risks. Fearful of what would happen. Fearful of this gift given by his master and so he doesn't use it at all. And in fact, buries it. Oh, it's very easy to come away from this parable with the idea that, well, God measures how much you've done for him and that's whether or not he lets you into his kingdom. But that misses the whole point. You know, look at what God has provided for you. He's provided you life. He's provided you family, material possession, possessions. Wealth, skill, intelligence. Really, truly, none of these things belong to you permanently. They are yours, but they're given to you by God to steward, to take care of them. So the question is, do you look at the gifts that God has given you as gifts? Or do you look at them as burdens? Do you look at them as opportunities to be light in people's lives or as things to complain about and worry about 
and concern yourself about and be upset about. You see, the, the, the difference between the first two servants and that final servant is not whether or not they got a return on their investment. Ultimately, the difference is how do they view the gifts that God has given them? And how they view the gifts that God has given them entirely informs how they act from then on out. If you see what God has given you as truly a gift that can be used to better the world, great. But if you see it as a burden, something to worry about, have anxiety about, wonder if tomorrow's ever going to come again, you're going to bury it. You're going to be selfish. Not benefiting anybody, not even yourself. Because we are afraid of risks, aren't we? We're afraid of, of, of that, that money that God has provided to us. Maybe it's going to go away. We're worried about what others might think about us or worried about reaching out to that person in my community who's feeling lost and alone. Well, what if they ask too much of me? We're afraid of what it might mean to reach out, to make ourselves vulnerable. And so we bury our talent. We bury our ability because we're upset and nervous about where we're going. Now, I'm not here to say that every time you reach out with the gifts God has given you, it's going to go well. I'm not here to say that you're always going to be exactly where you want to be and you're going to have everything you've ever wanted. But I am here to say that your future is assured. Your future has been made exactly the way God wants it to be because he's given you the, his son on the cross. Those fears that we have as we bury our talents, as we, as we bury those things that God has provided for us, those fears are unfounded. Not that bad things can't happen. Not that we can't lose our money or someone's going to hurt us if we're vulnerable, but that no matter what happens, the cross is always there. The cross of Christ and his sacrifice and his death and his resurrection are infinitely more permanent than the money in the bank, the food in the fridge, the clothing in the closet, or the house on the hill. The grace of Jesus Christ is what sustains you, not the numerous gifts that we have. We're thankful for the clothing and shoes, house and home, spouse and children that we have received from God. But we look at the cross of Christ and know that even if they all go away, even if tragedy and disaster strikes us, our future is assured, not based on how much we've done, not based on how much we've saved, not based on our comfort or even our happiness. But our future is in Christ, provided as a forgiveness. A forgiveness even for those times of selfishness. Forgiveness for those times of greed and self-centeredness. Washing us clean from our past, from our sins, and from death itself. So I urge you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to see the gifts that God has given you as gifts, not burdens. Things to be excited about, not anxious about. But knowing that your future is entirely in the hands of Christ, who has already died for you, already rose for you, and already promises you an everlasting life with him. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.